Hi everybody, I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. I'm a clinical psychologist out of Fayetteville, Arkansas. And once again, you're on a Facebook Live on Mental Health on the Mighty. And I so appreciate being invited again to be here. It's Mother's Day on Sunday and Mother's Day and COVID don't necessarily um, strike a warm place in my heart <laughs> when you think about them together because so many of us will be away from moms that are really wonderful uh, or our children are away from us and and we can't um, hug. So um, that's going to be difficult in and of itself. And of course, there are difficulties um, with moms anyway that, you know, maybe your mom has passed away. Um, and so you're, you're grieving, especially on Mother's Day. So there can be lots of issues around Mother's Day. And that's what we're talking about today is what are some issues around Mother's Day that might be particularly helpful to you to talk about. Just a little bit about me. Um, I am, as I said, I'm a clinical psychologist out of Fayetteville, Arkansas. I've been doing these lives now for about three and a half years. I have always been in private practice since 1993, in fact, quite a long time. I actually uh, published a book last year called Perfectly Hidden Depression, which I'm not going to talk about today, but I am excited that it is now out on audiobook as of yesterday. So that's a lot of fun. Um, I have a podcast myself called The Self Work Podcast with Dr. Margaret Rutherford. That's me. And my website's drmargaretrutherford.com. I have a Facebook page also. I'd love to have you over there. So today we're going to be talking about emotionally unstable moms and how to deal with them during Mother's Day or any other day, really, but especially since it's the weekend is about um, what we can do around Mother's Day, then certainly it seemed apropos to talk about it. I hope, by the way, that all of you are safe and somewhat secure. I know there are a lot of people who aren't, and believe me, the folks here at the Mighty are doing their best to reach out to you and help you feel connected to something and to other people. And I want you to feel free to comment and question. I'm really gonna look forward to those. Um, I can sit and talk by myself for quite a few minutes, but I'd much rather have your input, um, whether you are facing being with a mom or you just wanna talk some about what your interactions in the past have been with your mom uh, around the issues of emotional instability. Now, there are a lot of ways that someone, and we're going to focus on moms mainly, again, again because of Mother's Day. It's not that dads can't be emotionally unstable. They can be, obviously. But right now, we're focusing on moms. Maybe we'll do, focus on dads uh, closer to Father's Day. You know, there can be bipolar disorder, obviously, which is a cyclic disorder. And um, uh, so, you know, that's going to have a lot of mood instability within it. Um, you can have narcissism, which um, is a personality disorder, which is also um, really, really characterized by a lot of manipulation and often what's called sort of love bombing or making you feel very special and like you, you are the perfect daughter, the perfect son. Um, but then when that love is withdrawn, you're someone very aloof and cold and, and someone who isn't particularly interested in you at all, uh, at least for that period of time. Uh, you're there to meet their needs, not the other way around. Um, hi, guys. I'm glad you're here. I'm in Arkansas, by the way, so uh, northwest Arkansas. So we are cold here. Um, but the third type which we really want to talk about more today are borderline um, people with borderline personality disorder. I don't want to call them borderlines, although I probably will, because that seems a little bit um, minimizing to me or uh, discounting. And I don't want to discount people with borderline personality disorder. In fact, what I want to make sure that I say is that, yes, we're going to be talking about how difficult it is to interact with them but at the same time, I cannot stress enough that I wouldn't wish borderline personality disorder on my worst enemy. It is a horribly painful, confusing, agitating, um, chaotic 
way of living your life. And almost all, if not all, your uh, relationships are very unstable. Um, hello. Hi, people. Oh, that's your mom. Hi, Jenna Ann. Um, okay. So, um, you know, it's, you may have some skills already that you've been using for years to help you cope with some of the disappointments and frustrations of having someone uh, as a mom who has borderline. Um, so I would love for you to share those skills with all of us because I will learn from you and maybe you'll learn from me and we'll go together. Um, we'll, we'll move together in that. Um, but certainly I'm going to be talking about some skills as well um, as far as how you can approach not only just Mother's Day, but this relationship with them in general. So I thought it would first be kind of interesting to talk a little bit about, um, hi, Tamara, very tough. Yeah, it is a very tough, tough personality disorder. Yeah, I was saying a little bit earlier that I wouldn't wish this on my enemy, and I, I have great empathy for people. I remember a patient I worked with many years ago, um, and we worked quite a while, um, said something to me like, it's like having a black hole in your soul. And there's nothing that can fill it up. Absolutely nothing that is enough to fill it up. That's how great their sense of abandonment is. That's how great their sense of um, not knowing themselves, not having a, 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 not having a real connection with who they are. That's called a not a clear sense of self, which simply means that you don't know from day to day, hour to hour, minute to minute, how exactly you're going to feel. So it is a very, very difficult thing to live with. Let me look at a couple of your comments. Um, I don't know why you said Sophie said thanks, but you're welcome. I've been diagnosed with BPD, but disagree with the diagnosis. What are the criteria for the diagnosis? Hi, Andrea. Um, so basically, we're going to go over the criteria. Um, let me read them. Um, these aren't the ones you're going to find in the, in the DSM-5, but these are a lot of them. Again, this lack of a clear sense of self um, where, um, you know, generally speaking, I know in the morning if I wake up in a certain mood, you know, that I'll either need to buck up and have a little bit better mood or change my mood or distract myself or something. But I can track how I do that, right? I can track what I do to help myself um, get a little more stable. Or the opposite, I wake up in a great mood and then suddenly, you know, I don't feel very great in the afternoon. I can usually realize how I'm being triggered. People with borderline don't have that clarity on what makes them them or what makes their emotional functioning uh, occur. Basically, they are just a ball of emotion, very raw emotion. And they often act on it very impulsively, sometimes with self-harm. Again, they have huge issues with abandonment. They can rage. They can have episodes and explosions of rage. They can. All, we're going to talk about the different subtypes of borderline. Um, but, you know, the, the most interesting thing I think about them is that um, what that they also have, well, hold on, they have very black and white thinking. Um, what they do is project onto other people. Uh, they have a lot of self-loathing, so they may project that hatred onto you and think you hate them because they hate themselves. They have very, very little insight or empathy into their impact on they have on other people, on their behavior. And um, so, and th th this is what I was about to say a minute ago. I think one of the most interesting things and really uh, puzzling things is that often out in public, um, people with borderline personality disorder look fine. They look normal in a structured environment. They can do very well um, and have absolutely great relationships with other people. It's when those relationships have an intimacy to them that they fall apart. Let me look at some um, some. Um, uh, comments. I'm 73 and have a difficult relationship with my 44 year old daughter. She left the area and my husband died suddenly. She now has two other children I've never met. I keep trying to keep the door open, 
the cremation tried to say nothing that might be interpreted as inflammatory. I can't seem to get it right to say my soul, my son, one has bipolar, the other fine and racing to boys. I dread Mother's Day. How can I get through it unscathed? Um, well, hi, Linda. Um, I don't know what's gone on that your your relationship with your daughter is estranged and you haven't seen her in so long. Um, there could be lots of reasons for that. I don't know. It, it sounds like you're you're unclear about what you could possibly, uh, what part of that process that you might have played. I don't know. Um, let me see. No, but she left the area when my husband died suddenly. Okay, so something about that uh, trauma caused her to flee the family, and I don't know if she was very close to him or being in the family became a reminder of him or he was abusive to her. I don't know. Obviously, there are way too many factors for that. But I think that um, one of the things you can do, Linda, or try very hard to do, is look at the relationships you do have in your life rather than the ones you don't. Um, it's sort of rather than focusing on what it, Mother's Day was like 10 years ago, um, you know, really try to focus on the positives of today. Um, I don't know if your daughter, after all this is over with COVID, and well, that may be a while, but um, if she would do some therapy with you, um, if that would be something that she, or even just write you a letter and, um, and, and you can write her back. If she's in therapy, it might be helpful to offer to have a session with her and her therapist um, so that you can begin to try to understand what's going on. Because it sounds like other than your your father, your husband's death, you don't know why she left. Um, and obviously, I don't either. But I, I, for, for Mother's Day, um, and some people, you know, in situations like this, just don't do anything Mother's Day. They just kind of try to let the day be, and that's it. Um, and you can certainly do that, but if you have, um, some children that do, you do have a great relationship with, and I would focus on those. Let's talk about some, um, let's talk about some categories of, of borderline personality. These I've taken from Dr. Christine Lawson's book called Understanding the Borderline Mother, which is an excellent book. It's an expensive book. So you can maybe look for it in your public library, but uh, it's like fifty-seven dollars, I think, something like that. So it's a, it's a, and it's huge. It's a tome. So, um, but the, she calls them four, four different types. There's the waif, the hermit, the queen, and the witch. Um, you know, I've seen other uh, categorizations of borderline that are, you know, low functioning and where people are suicidal often and are in the hospital often and don't function very well versus high functioning borderlines who, you know, can maintain pretty well, especially with structure that's created for them. Um, there's an externalizing, internalizing borderline, which again, you know, I think people are just kind of coming up with these, but I really like Dr. Lawson's uh, stuff. The WAIF, she's, uh, they're a complain, but they refuse to get help. They're both helpless and manipulative. They see life as very unsatisfying, and so they complain a lot, but they basically rigidly adhere to a sense of victimization. So there's the waif, then there's the hermit, which is a more fearful, avoidant kind of issue, uh, personality disorder. This is often born of trauma, real trauma, like sexual abuse or hard. So they are fearful, avoidant borderlines. The world is a dangerous place for them, and they have horrible problems with trust. Um, then there's the queen, and the queen is very controlling, as you might imagine. Um, she requires fierce loyalty, and she can be very ruthless and sort of bend the rules. If, if um, I don't know if I can give an example of that, but for example, if if the, the you cannot disagree with a queen. I mean, she you, you're stuck in the position of either fighting with her uh, incessantly or just acquiescing, or that's certainly what it can feel like because the queen is all about in control and being in control. And then there's the witch. Oh, the queen also said, I have this little note to myself. The queen also might say to you, you belong to me. You owe me everything for who you are. They would say things like that. Then there's the witch. Um, and the witch can be very sadistic. And what that means is that they act without regret. Um, they're the closest thing to sociopathy that you can get with borderline. And, and there's probably some overlap between 
uh, borderline personality or borderline personality disorder and sociopathic uh, personality in this particular category. We're very domineering. If you're not with me, you're against me. Um, and basically children live in fear of angering because the rage is so vicious. Um, I mean, horribly vicious. Um, so let me get to some of the questions. Again, I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. Delighted to be here with y'all. Um, Sophie, I live on an island in, island in Canada. Nobody talks about it's hard. Um, oh, and looks like, Linda, you're getting some empathy. That's wonderful. Um, uh oh. Bonnie, I really like the Mighty programs and have attended over 15. Many moms who have borderline personality disorder also have kids who've had, yes, recovery is possible. They have kids who also have borderline personality. Unfortunately, I'm finding this very stigmatizing to people who have it. Yes, it's tough for all involved. It seems like it's all or nothing right now in terms of people with diagnosis being referred. One of the things with diagnosis, if we want to talk about that for a second, is borderline personality disorder is often diagnosed as bipolar disorder. And there are a couple of reasons for this. One is very pragmatic, meaning that insurance company won't pay for a diagnosis, quote unquote, of a personality disorder of any kind. They will pay, obviously, for a diagnosis of bipolar disorder. So, and actually treatment is very similar, um, but there are some nuances which we don't necessarily need to go into here. But um, sometimes diagnosis is a little tricky because people might not diagnose with somebody with a personality disorder when they really think they probably have one. Um, and yes, you're right about the stigmatizing. Let me address what you said about borderline parents can also often have borderline children. Borderline behavior can be learned, just like depressive behavior can be learned, just like anxious behavior can be learned. So if I have a mom who rages at me and never says she's sorry, never even blinks an eye and just considers that it's her due to treat me that way, I could very well learn that same behavior with my own children. So um, borderline personality disorder does tend to run in families, but it, it also can skip generations as well. So there seems to be a genetic component to it or some kind of component we don't understand. Um, but you're right, it, it, it can be learned and um, it is one of the responses to having a borderline uh, parent or mom. Nicole, this is my mother to a T. No, <laughs> Sophie, here, middle. Oh, here, where you live, mental health is all drug addicted people. Yeah. Um, so many questions. Wish this wasn't public. Well, then you wouldn't be here either. <laughs> um, yeah, that's what I figured out. Andrew, let me start go down to a longer question. Laura, I was diagnosed with borderline personality. Andrea, so many therapists don't want to work with people diagnosed with borderline. Yeah. Um, you know, I remember in graduate school, I learned you never want to have more than one borderline in your practice because they are so, uh, they are just, um, you have to be very careful about your own boundaries. And so, and they also, it's interesting. And I, I wonder if there's a category that's probably better at this than any of them, but they have an uncanny ability. And I don't think that they would claim this, but I think probably because they are so externally focused, they're constantly looking at other people to see how they're evaluating them or are they gonna reject them or not? Are they gonna abandon them? that um, they notice things about me that most of my patients don't notice. For example, um, let's say I don't have on my wedding ring for some reason, and they'll say, oh, are, are you, you know, I just, well, no, that's not a very good example. Let's just say they say, they look at me and go, are you kind of tired today? You seem like you're tired, or you seem like your mind is a little far away or something. They're, they'll say things, and actually, they're accurate. <laughs> I might be a little tired or I'm having some focusing issues. It's a little uncanny. It's a little unnerving. Um, so, you know, now have I had more than one person with borderline personality disorder at a time? Yes, I have. Um, 
but I, it, it is it can be difficult work. You really have to set a lot of boundaries all the time. Um, I, I've said this on these broadcasts before, but I, um, for example, one of my uh, people with borderline years ago said she kept telling me, um, "Please call me back if you want to." When she'd leave me a message, so you can see the double meaning of that. If I call her back especially if I call her back quickly, I must really like her and want to talk to her. So she's special. She feels like she's not being abandoned. If I don't call her back immediately or forget or whatever, I'm obviously don't like her and am abandoning her. And so what we did was we talked about the, the, um, the double whammy of that and that I wasn't going to, I, I needed her to stop asking me that or telling me that. Okay. So Nicole, let me see. I think I. Oh, Cameron, you're uh, okay. So you might someone needs a friend. Um, okay, so here we go. Nicole, do you confront them and tell them they are acting a certain way, or just agree with them? Neither. <laughs> um, sometimes you have to agree. You're right. But confronting someone who has this rigid a style of understanding their world and you really doesn't work very well uh, because they will immediately feel attacked or blamed. If they're the, if the victim kind, they'll feel like you're just hurting them. Uh, my own mother had some traits like this, and I can remember her OCD got so bad that there was literally um, inches of dust on her because she wouldn't let anybody clean her dressing room, dressing table. And so it was a little counter to what you think of as OCD, but she was a hoarder. And so, you know, but literally there was, it was you know, you go and the whole room sort of exploded with dust. And I'm making it sound funny. It was tragic, actually. And I remember one time trying my best to say, Mom, will you let us come in here or will you let me come in here and clean off some of this dust? And she looked at me and she said, I don't come in your house. And and um, I don't come in your house and judge you or which was actually not true um, and tell you you needed to change things. I, I think that's horrible. And you're, you're beating me up for no reason. So you can see how my very rational concern and my very gentle confrontation was perceived as an attack. So um, you want instead and we'll talk about that in a minute. You want instead to stay very rational and not get into your own emotional um, self as you're trying to respond to them or approach them about boundaries and we'll talk about boundaries here in a second um hi laura my therapist wants me to do a group therapy i don't do good with that i prefer one-on-one -on -one. hi laura um well she may want you to do group if, if she has diagnosed with you you with borderline, the thing that groups will do that individual doesn't tend to do is well, it can, but it depends on your therapist. Is that others can actually ask you to look at your struggle with not taking, not being um, aware or of, of the impact that you have on other people. Because they will say, when I was talking about that, you look bored, or when I, uh, or, you know, they will give you the group process will help you develop some empathy for yourself or some understanding that maybe you don't have. Now, it's not that one on one can't do that. But it can, but it's almost multiplied. It's exponentially um, uh, realized instead of just with one person. Um, also, you know, it. I, I've only done one group in my life, but I found it very helpful to just get feedback on how I was coming across. Um, and it was, I didn't like it sometimes. And again, if you have borderline personality disorder, you might feel easily attacked. Um, but uh, that's something you can work on as well and realize that people are just giving you their perceptions. Um, Uh, Bonnie, I'm referring to what you're saying about um, them versus others as stigmatizing. People who have borderline personality are unable to get help because the stigma sometimes by professionals. You actually just stated yourself, I don't have one. Um, you know, 
are borderline stigmatized in our in our profession. Some some in our profession, yes. Um, but I would not say that about everyone. I mean, I uh, try. I mean, as I say, I wouldn't. I mean, I, this is a very chaotic and frightening uh, disorder to have. Uh, so I. Because, because they tend to be more difficult and they may put you to the test a lot, that doesn't mean that they are not people who deserve help. They definitely are. And so I, I'm i sure just like there are doctors who don't want to treat people who smoke because they are, you know, they're not being, or don't exercise or whatever it is. So I'm sure there are people in my profession that, are choosing not to do that kind of work. They don't like it. Um, it's too difficult for them um, because it is hard work, but it's also can be quite, uh, in fact, I worked, I was, saw somebody yesterday that has some borderline traits, definitely. And we've talked about it. I've seen her quite a long time and she's had a baby and she was just telling me um, that our work together had meant a lot to her. So, um, and she is a lot healthier than she was in many ways. So, um, you know, I hope that's an answer to your question. Bonnie, I'm hoping to get feedback on handling mental health on Mother's Day without it being about people's diagnoses. Well, yeah, sure. Um, today we're kind of talking about that, but, um, you know, I, I, um, mental health on Mother's Day. I mean, it's just, um, you know, I, I think uh, as we open the, the broadcast kind of talking a lot about how this is a time when there are many of us who either, even if we live next door to our kids and are, and glad, are glad about that, that we can't have the traditional Mother's Day uh, celebration uh, if you did have it. And that can be jarring for a lot of people. Maybe that day was very, very special to you. Uh, and it's always been something you really enjoy. Um, we have we have people who want to be mothers and have infertility issues. We have people whose mothers have died. Um, so there are a lot of things about any holiday um, that we that holiday is often a marker of something else. We kind of go, oh, last Mother's Day, I know what I was doing, so we can remember. And this Mother's Day, you know, you can try to create an experience that you remember and remember positively. Um, and but you can probably have to be pretty creative. Um, so, you know, if, if Mother's Day is hard for you, then for whatever reason, then I would try to uh, write about it and journal about it a lot and try to understand um, why it's hard. How long has it been hard? Um, are you just grieving the lack of a relationship with a mother at all? Kind of like one of the people earlier. Uh, she doesn't have a relationship with one of her children. Maybe you don't have a relationship with your mom for whatever reason. Um, maybe she left. Maybe she um, is an alcoholic, whatever. Um, so there are plenty of these kinds of markers that uh, and days and anniversaries and holidays that tend to act as a time when we sort of assess um our relationships and this is one of those days um for many people um for others it's it's a, it's considered another hallmark uh holiday and they really don't uh, do too much about it but um anyway it's um i hope you get through it okay and if you have a more specific question i'd be happy to try to answer that um Amy, how do you treat depression and make friends if you have borderline personality disorder? What a great question. Um, I think that learning, mostly it's learning about, um, well, let me, let me say this as my mind sort of organizes any answer to this question. One thing, you heard me say a few minutes ago that the patient I worked with had borderline traits. Not everybody who has borderline traits has borderline personality disorder. It's on a spectrum. And so, you know, you can have someone that has just a couple of borderline traits 
Um, and you don't even really know if they would qualify for being called borderline. But one of the major things is to not that lack of empathy. So you can work on empathy. Um, you can begin to, um, you know, you say about depression and borderline, frequently people who are depressed in and of itself lose their ability to have empathy for other people. Sometimes, not all the time, but they can be so uh, focused on what's going on internally within them that they, uh, justifiably, that they don't have that sense of, I don't really care whether you're upset about something or not. I've, I've got too much. I'm just self-involved. Depression is a can be a very self-involved disorder by definition. Um, so... Um, that's why it's so lonely. Um, so depression is a part of borderline. It is, you know, you're either, you're, again, your moods are so varied and one of them could be intense sadness or what will feel like depression. Um, but as far as making friends, I think you have to develop a sense of empathy, realizing that if you say something harsh or quick or impulsive, that can hurt someone else's feelings or that if you blame them or you um, you rage at them, obviously that's going to be a problem. So I would work on empathy and um, there are some, there's some, I'm trying to think of a book on empathy. Um, I think, you know, the more you have self-compassion, the more you're going to tend to show that kind of compassion for other people. So that might be a place to start. Um, Jenna, and what are some ways we can deal with an emotionally unstable mother, mom or mother side? Okay, here we go. I mentioned boundaries a, a few minutes ago. And um, what I mean by that is that really, all, borderline is a part of a cluster of personality disorders called cluster B. And it has also has narcissism, uh, sociopathy, and uh, what's called a histrionic personality disorder. All of these uh Personality disorders are um, disorders of emotion. And so with borderlines, um, they are always vigilant for what's going on emotionally in the room. And they will, again, probably unintentionally uh, either feel blamed by you or victimized by you, or they're very sensitive to whether you're with them or against them. They're very sensitive to abandonment. I remember working with a woman one time whose mother um, definitely had some borderline traits. And um, this woman would go up about once a month. Her brother actually lived with their mom. But she would go up once a month to one to leave her brother. And also to, because uh, the mother was confined to the home at this point, um, big smoker and drinker. And um, so basically, what happened to her is that she said as soon as she walked in the door, she would sort of turn into her 12 year old self and feel very cowed by her mother and then emotionally react when her mother treated her poorly and get hurt that it was happening all over again. One of the things that can help very much is that you don't, you realize how hard it is for people with borderline personality disorder to understand what they're doing. And so, you know, usually that's what makes us all change, right? When we see the negative impact we're even, ha even having on ourselves or on other people. So without that, she is unlikely to change unless she really gets enough treatment, um, which many people never do. So one, you don't expect anything different than has happened in the past. Um, and if you do get something different and it's much more healthy, that's wonderful. And you can enjoy that, but I wouldn't walk in with that expectation so you don't get hurt or angry. Um, if your mom has addictive issues um, or has things she brings up relentlessly or things that always get on your nerves that you've asked her a hundred times not to do, if you get angry about those things or you get, I can't believe mom, you're drunk on Mother's Day or I can't believe that you brought my ex-husband up in front of the children or, you know, or my new boyfriend up in front of the children, whatever it is. Um, you know, if you get pulled into that, 
then and fight back or fight with or confront, then that's where you're going to have a problem. You simply can say, you know, mom, we talked about that. We're not going to talk about my first husband again. And if you continue talking about him, then the kids and I will have to leave. And you just say it calmly. And she may, I can't believe you're adopting that attitude or whatever. And then, you know, you just leave, even on Mother's Day, because you set a boundary with her. Now, often it's wise to talk about these boundaries before you ever get into the situation. So that she can't say necessarily, well, you never told me this or, you know, now you're changing the rules on me. So or you're trying to control me. Um, So you simply say, Mom, this time I want to come out and I'd love to spend some time with you but I'm not willing to talk about that you need money or I'm not willing to talk about, um, you know, I, I'm not willing to hear your anger anymore about something that you perceive I've done to you. And if you bring it up, then I will have to leave. And then you leave calmly to say, oh, we already talked about this, mom. Sorry you brought it up. I have to go now. Because you, with practice and exposure to this kind of boundary, um, people with borderline personality disorder may not like it, and they may, and especially, it's probably not very possible with a witch. I mean, that's just not possible. Um, there's really very little to do about people like that because they are just, um, you know, you enjoy when it's decent and then you protect yourself when it's not. Um, and I do think you do have to leave after that. But the boundaries are important. Your expectation, not having overly high expectations and then staying out of your own emotions, staying very rational and then having set boundaries prior to that and then stick to those boundaries. Okay, stick to those boundaries. Um, Some of y'all are talking with each other. Richard Fay, face obstacles head on. Nicole, is lying and making yourself the victim part of the disorder? For example, my mom has told people that she has cancer when she doesn't have it anymore. Um, so what an interesting question. And actually, I had something come up years ago that's very similar to this. Um, I was working with someone definitely with borderline traits and more like the waif and um, who's very needy. And she got cancer. And from her perspective, her family finally gave her the attention that she really wanted and needed, desperately needed. And I got a call from a local oncologist one afternoon. And he said, Mrs. So-and-so has given me permission to to reach out to you. And um, uh, she's here in my office and she's telling me she's going to kill herself if I tell her family that her cancer is in remission. And I don't know what to do. Um, it's time for her to leave. I've got other patients. And she's curled up in a ball in the in my waiting room, um, in my uh, the room he saw her in. So I hastened over there and just got, got down on the floor with her and said, what's going on? And she was crying. And she said, he can't tell them. I'm in remission. They'll all go away again. You can hear the fear of abandonment. You can hear the irrationality. But from her perception, she her final her her life was finally better. Um, so we did work it out, by the way. Um, we, we found a way to kind of balance out. The doctor was going to not lie to her family, but say to her family, yes, the cancer's in remission, but you never, you know, this kind of cancer may come back or something just to keep her stable. Then she and I really worked together on it and, and um, that got better in and of itself. But, you know, somehow your mother, by not telling people that the cancer is gone or is in remission, may have received some kind of attention or something that she doesn't want to go away. And the only way she knows how is to, um, or, you know, she kind of, I don't know, like you said, enjoyed the um, the label of being someone who was suffering. Um, Laura, my family doesn't respect my boundaries. So I've learned to just shut down and keep mute. Okay. Um, well, I mean, you can do that. I don't know. I mean, obviously, if you don't give them information, then they can't uh, not respect it. 
um, I don't know exactly what you, when you say you're mute. I mean, it, it, you're just taking part in your family, but not an active part, I would guess. So um, I hate that for you, that that you can't seem to find a little bit more engaging way to deal with that. Um, maybe you grew up in a family or are in a family where, um, you know, trouble things or, or you know, People are supposed to stay invisible. I mean, maybe there's a very controlling parent in your home, or um, I don't know. I don't know the reason why those boundaries aren't being respected. Uh, some people are reared in, in families where, um, you know, there are no confidences that everybody should know everybody else's business all the time. And so th those are called enmeshed families. And those could be families where, you know, you tell somebody, please keep this to yourself. And, you know, it's, it's all over everywhere the next day. So you may have grown up in that kind of family as well. Um, okay, I'm gonna take one more question. How can I support foster youth that feel depressed during Mother's Day? Yeah, Ooh. Well, this is not a specialty of mine of any kind, but I've certainly, uh, and I've not dealt with all that many foster children in my practice. I don't see kids at all, but people who are foster children as adults. I have obviously seen some. Um, of course, some foster children know exactly who their mother is or who their father is, and um, they maybe even have a relationship with them. So I'm assuming you're talking about foster children who do not. Um, you know, I, I, I think that it's very, very difficult. I mean, I see, hear the same thing sometimes from some adopted children. Um, of this reaction of I wasn't wanted when I was young or I wasn't taken care of. I think probably um, a lot of people will come to the conclusion that the parent wasn't withholding, or I try to guide them to the fact that the parent wasn't necessarily withholding something from them that they had the cap capability of giving. They probably didn't have the capability of giving them care or safety or support in the first place. And so they were either taken away um, but of course, you've then also got the damage done from whatever happened to them before they were taken away. And that's usually trauma or abuse or neglect of some kind. So, um, you know, Mother's Day, I would ask them, I'd say, you know, what would help you today? Would you like to talk to me about the mother you wish you had or the person you you know, how could you turn it more into something that they could think about? Um, you know, maybe they could say, say to you, well, you know, this is the kind of mother I want to be. Um, and you could say, well, let's, you know, let's work on you becoming that kind of mom um, or dad. You know, what do you, what do you need to do? I mean, obviously, if they're really struggling, then, you know, you can get them some therapy from someone probably who knows a lot about foster children. I would. Um, if I got a call to see a foster child, I would say, no, what I, again, I don't see children, but I wouldn't be the right therapist for that. So someone who's very well acquainted with their issues and can talk to that uh, immediately. Okay, let me see. Okay, got one more. Kylie, I have BPG and my mom had a narcissistic. We can never seem to get along. What are ways to deal with the opposite? Well, those those things aren't opposite in my in my from my perspective, Kylie. Um, in fact, they're in the same uh, cluster of personality disorders, so they may look a lot different and they may feel a lot different, but they're they've got some similarities um, in that probably more severe um, people with either one of those uh, personality disorders at the more severe level also have trouble with manipulation. Actually, abandonment is part of a narcissist struggle too, because you know they can abandon you and leave you out to dry, but if you threaten to abandon them or just you get tired of it, they will come rushing back to make sure that you are still part of their um, group of people who are there to offer them admiration and support and affirmation. So um, it's tough when you've got those kinds of issues. Actually, you know, in my field, we often see 
two people who are married to one another, one with borderline features and one with narcissistic features, mainly because of that dynamic I just said, that both fear abandonment. And so um, it is a rocky, rocky, chaotic relationship. And if it's between mother and child or father and child, then um, that's also going to be really rocky. And of course, the child doesn't know what's going on. So, um, you know, what I would probably do, um, if since you are the one with borderline, there is a book called Disarming the Narcissist. It might be very helpful for you to read, but also in as it pertains to you. Um, so, and of course, um, you know, I Hate You, Don't Leave Me is a classic book for borderlines. So, or for people with borderlines. So, um, that also might help you gain some insight into yourself. You know, lack of empathy is also part of both borderline and narcissistic, and it's just in a little different way. Okay, well, we're going to stop for today. Thank y'all for being here. Again, I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. Um, my podcast is the Self Work Podcast with me, Dr. Margaret Rutherford. My website's Dr. Margaret Rutherford. Dr. Margaret Rutherford. Com. Come on over to my Facebook page at facebook.com slash Dr. Margaret Rutherford. Love to have you there. I post there my own um, articles and podcasts, but also ones that I find that are funny or, or smart or helpful in some way. Um, so I hope that your Mother's Day goes as well as it can. Um, my son is out in L.A. and my mother is deceased. So... <laughs> Bless my husband's heart. It's it's up to him. <laughs> I'm sure my my son will call. Um, but anyway, I, I'm actually very blessed to be a mom because I had my son through in vitro fertilization. So every Mother's Day, I definitely give up a little um, thank you to the powers that be that I was blessed enough to become a mom. So thank you. I will see y'all later this week. I uh, this month. I can't. I I want to say it's the twentieth of may at three o'clock uh two o'clock central standard time i'm usually on two o'clock wednesday afternoon third wednesday of the month i'm not sure what we're going to be talking about um but i would love to have y'all here so um i'll see you then again thank you so much for being here take care good care <laughs>